Okay, so uh, now Astrid will talk about conflict free graph parallel. Okay, thank you. So this talk is based on joint work with Hans Botlander and Sudeshna Kulai. And I will be talking about conflict-free graph coloring. Um, so I'm not sure whether you've heard of the problem, so let me start by introducing the problem I will be talking about. So I want to look at Q close neighborhood conflict-free graph coloring. So on input, we're given a graph. And because vertex cover will be the parameter for the rest of my talk, I also assume that we're given a vertex cover of this graph. Um, and now the question is whether we can color this graph. So we want to color every vertex of the graph with one out of Q colors in such a way that if you look at the closed neighborhood of any vertex of, this, of any vertex of the graph, then there is a color that occurs exactly once in this closed neighborhood. So basically every closed neighborhood has one uniquely colored vertex. Um, of course, here I'm discussing closed neighborhoods, but naturally you can ask the same question for open neighborhoods and you get the Q open neighborhood conflict-free graph coloring problem. Um, I will mention a couple of results about this problem as well, but let's stick to closed neighborhoods for now. So as an example, suppose we have this graph, then we can color this with three colors in this way. So you see that this is not a proper coloring because we have two connected red vertices here, but it's a closed neighborhood conflict-free coloring, um, because if we look at vertex U, then it has exactly one blue vertex in its closed neighborhood, namely the vertex itself. And the same is actually true for any of these red vertices. They all see vertex U. And then vertex X is, again, the only green vertex in its closed neighborhood. Okay, so let's get a bit of a more of a feel for this problem. So suppose we want to CNCF color a clique. Well, then we can actually do this with only two colors by just coloring one vertex in blue and coloring all other vertices in red. And then everybody sees exactly one blue vertex. Um, if we want to color a bipartite graph, then we can again do this with two colors because every vertex, if you color it like this, will have itself as it's like conflict-free color. Um, so an odd cycle, for example, you can also do with two colors. You pick two neighbors that you give the same color and then you alternate um, on the other vertices. And if anyone is interested, you can also two color the Peterson graph. Um, in particular, we know that if you have a K colorable graph, um, you can CNCF color it with K colors by taking the exact same coloring because every vertex will have a color that's different from all of its neighbors in this way. Okay, so now this problem is a special case of, I think, the well-studied conflict-free coloring problem where you have uh, a universe and some set of sets over this universe. And the question is to color the elements of your universe such that all of your sets are conflict-free colored. Um, and this is just a special case where these sets are given by closed or open neighborhoods of some underlying graph structure. And this is a well-studied problem, for example, uh, with respect to frequency assignment problems, where you want to assign radio frequencies or something, but you have issues with interference and you want to make sure that there's always at least one radio tower you can connect to without interference. Um, and the CNCF coloring problem was introduced later and it's been well studied from a combinatorial perspective. For example, um, we know that if you have an N vertex graph, you can always CNCF color it with order log squared N colors. And we also know that there are graphs for which you actually need this many colors. So this bond is in some sense tight. Um, and from an algorithmic perspective, we know that the problem is MP hard as soon as you have at least two colors. And it's obviously trivial if you have only one. Um, so it makes sense to look at the parameterized complexity of the problem, which has also been done. Um, so we know it's FPT when parameterized by either of these parameters, by vertex cover, by neighborhood diversity, and I think also by tree width, which I think follows from Courcelles theorem as well. Um, and in this talk, I want to talk about kernelization for the problem. Um, so Let's look at conflict-free coloring when parameterized by the size of a vertex cover of this graph. Um, then what I want to show in this talk is that 2 CNCF coloring actually has a polynomial kernel with this parameter. 
um, and we can actually get a dichotomy result because we can show that if we have at least three colors, then Q, C, and CF coloring no longer has a polynomial kernel when parameterized by vertex cover. And we can actually show that Q on CF coloring um, does not have a polynomial kernel even if we only have two colors. So both of these results are proven by cross composition, um, but I will not give the proof in this talk. So to get towards uh, this kernelization result, the first thing I want to look at um, is a general reduction rule <coughs> that actually works for Q, C, and CF coloring in general, but does not lead to a polynomial kernel straight away. Um, so the idea is as follows. Suppose your vertex cover S is given and you have some subset of the vertex cover S prime. Now, if there are many vertices outside of your vertex cover that all have neighborhood exactly S prime, you do not need to keep all of them. So in particular, if you have more than Q plus one vertices that have the same neighborhood S prime, you can mark Q plus one of those and remove all others. So if Q is three here, then we can mark four of these vertices and remove this remaining vertex that has the same neighborhood. Okay, so that gives a reduction rule. Now, of course, I need to argue that this reduction rule is actually safe. So suppose that the graph after um, removing this one vertex is D prime. And now suppose that our original graph was Q, C, and C, F colorable, then I need to argue that our new graph is also Q, C, and C, F colorable. And note that this is not obvious, um, because it's not true that this problem is closed under taking subgraphs, because in particular we saw that you can color a clique with only two colors in our setting, um, but that's definitely not true for any graph. So we need to be a little bit careful. Um, but suppose we have this coloring for the original graph, the first thing we do is we take the same coloring for the vertex cover of our new graph, and also for all vertices except those that have exactly the neighborhood S prime. Um, now for these vertices, we need to be a little bit careful because if we just stupidly keep the same coloring, then we're removing this red vertex here, but maybe that's the only red vertex that this green vertex sees, um, so we cannot just delete it. But what we can do is just ensure that every color that occurs exactly once here also occurs exactly once here, um, and those that occur at least once here will occur at least once here because we have Q plus one vertices that we marked and we have only Q colors. Um, so if we do that and we just remove one of these blue vertices, but that does not really matter. Um, so for the other direction, we need to argue that if this new graph G prime is uh, Q conflict free colorable, then we know how to color the original graph. So now, because we marked Q plus one vertices here and we only have Q colors, we know that there is some color here that already occurs twice. But well, if it already occurs twice, then it might as well occur more times. So we just use that color um, to color the vertex text that we removed um, to obtain a coloring of the original graph. Okay, and this is still a Q, C, and CF coloring because if you look at any vertex um, from the vertex cover, well, then the only change is that it might now see an additional blue vertex, but it already saw two blue vertices, so that's fine. And for the vertices outside of the vertex cover, nothing changed. Okay, so this gives a general reduction rule. So we can analyze what happens if we apply this reduction rule exhaustively. So we could do this uh, rule for all subsets of S. Um, well, maybe not in polynomial time, but we could in principle do this. Um, now, the number of vertices in S was k by definition, and we can analyze the number of degree d vertices not in S for every constant d, and then you see um, for every subset, so there are S choose d subsets, uh, we mark q plus 1, so you get uh, k to the d degree d vertices. Um, but unfortunately, of course, if you sum that all up, you get exponentially many vertices, um, which is a bit of an issue. But in principle, if we could now somehow bound the number of high degree vertices that are not in S and combine that with the fact that for the number of low degree vertices we have this bound, um, then we might be able to get to polynomial. Um, so that is going to be sort of the idea. And 
to get that idea, let me first show you a, a polynomial kernel for a special case of two CNCF coloring, namely two CNCF coloring extension, um, which is just a simplified version of the problem where we're given a graph with a vertex cover, but we imagine that we already have decided on how to color this vertex cover. So this two coloring is already given, and the only question is whether we can extend it to two CNCF color the entire graph. Okay, so in this case you can do that. Um, but in general, it's MP hard to decide whether or not this is possible. Now, I want to give a polynomial kernel for this problem. And the first reduction rule is trivial. If at some point in time you have a vertex whose close neighborhood has two red and two blue vertices, well, then there's nothing you can do to make it a conflict free coloring. Um, so you output um, a constant size no instance. Okay, so. The next thing we want to do is reduce the number of low degree vertices and by low degree I here mean that they have degree at most 2. So for every set S prime that's a subset of our vertex cover that has size at most 2, I will mark at most 3 vertices that have neighborhood exactly S prime, uh, which is just the same reduction rule that I showed earlier. And I will delete the unmarked vertices of degree 1 and 2. So what this does for us is reduce the number of vertices of degree at most 2 to order k squared. Um, but the number of degree 3 vertices outside of our vertex cover could still be large. Um, so we still need to handle these. Um, but handling these actually turns out to be pretty easy once you've already decided how to color your vertex cover. Um, because actually the coloring of such a vertex is immediately implied by the coloring of your vertex cover. Um, we can actually only be, because it never has both two red and two blue neighbors, we can only be in one of four situations. It could be that we have a vertex V and that its neighborhood is entirely blue. So to extend it to a conflict-free coloring, we must color the vertex red. It could be that it has exactly red, one red neighbor and then we must color the vertex blue. It could be that it has exactly one blue neighbor and it must be red, or that it has only red neighbors and then it must be blue. Okay, so since we know this anyway, we just extend um, the coloring using this rule, such that we are now in the situation where we have a vertex cover, and then outside of the vertex cover, we have order k squared vertices of low degree, and arbitrarily many vertices of high degree, but we already know how to color them. Um, but, well, if we already have them colored, then we can now actually do a marking procedure to reduce their number. Um, because if we look at a vertex in the vertex cover, um, then we care about the number of red and blue vertices that occur in its closed neighborhood. But actually we don't really care, we only care whether it has one red neighbor, zero red neighbors, or two or more red neighbors, and the same is true for blue. So it's actually sufficient to look at each vertex in our vertex cover and to just mark at most two red and two blue neighbors. If they exist. Okay, so we can just do this marking procedure. Um, and we mark one more vertex. And then in the end, if there is some vertex that was not marked, we can just delete it. I hope. Yeah. Um, because you really don't care if there's more than two red neighbors. You already kept this information by storing two red neighbors. You don't need any others. Um, Okay, so this actually gives us a kernel. So the number of high degree vertices that we just marked was at most four times the size of the vertex cover. And we already reduced the number of degree at most two vertices outside of the vertex cover to order k squared. So in total, we have order k squared vertices. Now it's not immediately obvious that this can also get you a kernel of that size because there could of course be many edges that you also need to store. Um, but I say you can do a little more work and obtain a kernel that you can store in order k squared log k bits. Um, and we also show that there is actually no kernel of subquadratic size under the assumption that mp is not in co mp slash poly, which means that this actually gives a tight kernelization bound up to some logarithmic factor. Okay, so now we understand how to get a polynomial kernel for two C and CF coloring extension. Um, but what I actually want to look at, of course, is to CNCF coloring itself. Um, now, for two CNCF coloring, I will not actually be presenting a polynomial kernel. I will give a generalized kernel, or maybe called a compression in the previous talk, 
where we take an instance of two CNCF coloring, but we output an instance of a different problem. And that different problem is going to be D polynomial root CSP. So let me start by first defining what the new problem is going to be. So we're given a, given a set L of polynomial equalities over some set of variables X. And each polynomial equality is just some polynomial over the variables from X equals zero. And I require that all these polynomials have degree at most D. Um, so the parameter for this problem is just going to be the number of variables we have. And the question is simply whether we can give an assignment to the variables that assigns zero or one to each of our variables, such that all of these equalities are satisfied. Okay, so note that I only care about Boolean assignments here. So as a small example, maybe we have two polynomials, one being x1 plus x2 minus one is zero, and the other one being x1 times x2 plus x2 times x3 is zero. Um, then this is an example of two polynomial root CSP because the second polynomial has degree two and the first one has only degree one. And we can satisfy it by setting x1 and x3 equal to zero and x2 equal to one. Okay, so now the nice thing about this problem is that we actually know a kernelization result for it. So this problem has a kernel that has um, order n to the d polynomial equalities, where n was the number of variables and d was the degree. And actually, it, it is a kernel that also um, ensures that the result you get is actually a subset of the original equalities. And even stronger, um, the satisfying assignments to this subset are also satisfying assignments to the original set of equalities and vice versa. So they're really equivalent in every way you can imagine. Now, I will just use this theorem as a <coughs> black box result. And I think Bart will tell you more about how to actually do this tomorrow. Um, so let's see what the plan is to actually get a kernel for CNCF coloring. So the first thing I want to do is reduce the number of low degree vertices that were not in the vertex cover again, um, which I will do at the, in the exact same way as we did previously. Um, then I want to rewrite the problem to an instance of D polynomial root CSP. And then I want to apply this known kernelization result for D polynomial root CSP to actually get the polynomial kernel. And now this is where you need to be a little careful um, because this kernel gets has size, well, number of variables to the power of the degree. So I need to be careful with two things. I need to make sure that these degrees do not get high. This has to be some kind of constant. And I cannot use too many variables. So I cannot just introduce a variable for every vertex because then I get a kernel of size n to the d, which makes no sense. Um, I need to make sure that this number of variables is some, well, ideally something like linear in k. Okay, so First thing was reducing the number of low degree vertices. Well, I do the exact same marking procedure as earlier um, and reduce the number to order k squared. So we have only order k squared vertices of low degree that are not in the vertex cover. Now, I do not really want to deal with them for the rest of the talk. So I will put them in the vertex cover and, present that, and pretend that they never existed. Um, so this would technically increase the size of our vertex cover, but in the analysis we could work around it. So I'll just pretend that our vertex cover has size k and that these low degree vertices um, magically disappeared. Okay, so the m more interesting step is maybe to rewrite this to an instance of deep polynomial root CSP. So the first thing I will do is for each vertex, I create two variables, rv and bv. And RV equals one means that V is red and BV equals one means that V is blue. And I will add this equality saying that they must sum to one because I want that each vertex is either red or blue. Now I just said two slides ago that I would not add a variable for every vertex because that is bad. Um, and it is still bad, but I will show how to get rid of them uh, in a couple of minutes. So for now we just have a variable for each vertex. Um, now, of course, we need to make sure that this coloring we get is a conflict-free coloring. So for every closed neighborhood, we need to add the constraint that it has either exactly one blue vertex or exactly one red vertex. So in terms of the variables that we just introduced, that means if you sum over RU for all U in the closed neighborhood of V, and then this must be one or otherwise if we sum over the BU, then that must be one. And we can model this as a degree to polynomial equality 
uh, by just saying that this must be zero because then either this is one or that is one. Okay, so now we have an instance actually of two polynomial root CSP. And if you can satisfy this instance, um, then you can also conflict free color the original graph and vice versa. Um, so that's nice, these two problems are equivalent. And we only use degree two polynomials, so that's going well as well. Um, but as I said earlier, the issue is that we now have many variables. We have as many variables as vertices. So I want to reduce the number of variables um, to something like order k instead of order n, like we have now. Um, so to do this, um, I observed something similar we observed earlier. So I ensure that every vertex outside the vertex cover now has degree at least three by ignoring the ones that have degree at most two. Um, so now its coloring is actually precisely determined by the coloring of its neighborhood, as we saw previously. Um, but the only issue is that we don't actually know the coloring of its neighborhood right now because it's not yet colored. Um, but what we do know is that actually then RV is just some function of the coloring of this open neighborhood. And this open neighborhood only has vertices that are in the vertex cover, so that does not um, consider too many variables. Now, if we could write this function um, as some low degree polynomial, then what we could try to do is substitute RV um, by this low degree polynomial that depends on variables that are variables that correspond to vertices that are in the vertex cover, so there are not too many. Um, and then we can reduce the number of variables to 2k. Okay, so we need to be a little bit careful because these four cases only consider the cases where um, the neighborhood is, of V is colored in such a way that this conflict-free coloring can possibly be extended to also color V. There's no cases where there's two red and two blue ones, and there also should not be cases such that there's two red and two blue ones. Um, but I need to actually make sure that this does not happen because otherwise strange things can happen if I do the substitution a bit carelessly. So I will add um, for every vertex outside of our vertex cover, I want to add an additional polynomial equality that simply ensures that if you look at the open neighborhood of this vertex, then either it is completely blue, meaning if you sum over the red ones, it's zero, or it's completely red, or it has exactly one red one or exactly one blue vertex. And I can do that by adding these polynomials and they have degree four, so that's still constant, so that's fine. And then I need to now show how we actually define um, this function that we use for the substitution. So let's look at an example of a vertex V here that has degree exactly four. Now we see that if it has only red neighbors, then if we sum over um, the variables corresponding to the neighbors being red, the sum is four and this implies that RV must be zero. Now if the sum is three, you see that we have one blue vertex and RV must be red, so RV is one. Um, if the sum equals one, we see that RV is zero and if the sum equals zero, then RV is one. So what I'm trying to say here is that actually um, RV only depends on the value of this sum. Um, so what I now want to do is I want to pick some polynomial G such that if you give input one or four, then it gives output zero. And if you give input zero or three, then it gives output one. Okay, so that if we apply G to this sum, then we get exactly our value for RV back such that in all our polynomial equalities, we can just substitute RV by this function. So to do this in general, um, what we would do if we have a vertex outside the vertex cover, we find a polynomial G that will output zero um, if the sum is either one or um, the size of the neighborhood of V, um, because then we want that this vertex gets color blue, so RV is zero, and it should output one if x is either zero or the size of the neighborhood of v minus one. And what we can now do is use some interpolating polynomial on these coordinates that we just described. And we can get a degree three interpolating polynomial for this um, that I will not write down here, but it's not very interesting. Um, so if we have some vertex rv, then we can replace it by this function g that we obtain here applied to this sum. And of course, uh, this function g depends on v, or I mean, it depends on the size of the neighborhood of v, obviously, uh, but that's fine. 
Okay, so what we now get is we have um, an instance of the polynomial root CSP that has two variables for every vertex in the vertex cover. Um, that has the constraint that every vertex is either red or blue. And furthermore, we had these original constraints for all the closed neighborhoods that they have one red or one blue vertex. Um, but here we substituted these RVs by these functions uh, for all V that are not in our vertex cover. And then finally, we had this uh, additional safety measure, uh, which uh, only considered po um, variables that were in the vertex cover anyway. Um, so these polynomials have degree at most six, this polynomial have, has degree four, and this polynomial originally had degree two, but now that we substitute some variables by degree three polynomials, it might have degree six. And actually this replacement step was um, safe. So in one direction, if you have this coloring, then we chose G in such a way that if you apply G to this coloring, you get exactly RV back. And in the other direction, that's where you need that we have this additional uh, constraint such that we actually know that you, if you compute the sum for some vertex over all its neighbors, then this actually is one of these values such that we know how our function G behaves because outside of these values, um, I'm not sure what will turn out. Um, such that we now have an instance of six polynomial root CSP that's equivalent to our original 2CNCF coloring instance. Um, and that has only two K variables. So now we can actually use our black box kernelization algorithm and obtain an instance that has only order K to the six um, equalities. Okay, so that's polynomial in K, so that's good. Now it's not immediately obvious that if you have order K to the six polynomial equalities, um, that this is a kernel in the sense that you can also encode this in a good way. Um, but with a little bit of effort, you can show that you can encode this in order K to the 10 bits. Um, so that means that we have given a generalized kernel of size order k to the 10 for this problem. And if you use that both problems are NP-complete, you can actually turn this into a polynomial kernel for two CNCF coloring when parameterized by the size of a vertex cover. Okay, so to conclude, we have this nice dichotomy result where two CNCF coloring has a polynomial kernel, um, but as soon as you have more colors or you look at ONCF coloring, then it does not. Now I have an maybe obvious open question, which is, is this order k to the 10 kernel optimal? And my best guess is that you should be able to do better because I see no reason that it should be order k to the 10. Um, and maybe a related question is whether there is an easier kernel that does not take this sort of strange detour via the polynomial root CSP, but that sort of directly uses the structure of the graph. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention. K kernel is modulo the usual nonsense or PNRD equal to NP or what? Um, oh, sorry, no, it's uh, modulo the usual nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> NP not in coin P slash poly. I don't really mean nonsense, I mean what nobody <laughs> seems to understand very well, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> or did I not? Oh. <laughs> <laughs>